Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, uh, we'll get started. Our apologies for the delay. Um, we just wanted to welcome everyone. Thank you very much for attending our CEO Grand Rounds. I can't see over the monitor. <laughs> I'll stand over here. <laughs> um, we're joined today also by uh, 11 telehealth sites throughout the region, um, including HSC, Riverview, Churchill, and a number of others. <laughs> Um, so there's 11 sites joining us as well. So welcome to everyone. Um, you may see them pop in and out on the on the display up here, um, and they'll they'll be taking in the uh, the event as well. So as is our uh, our tradition, I'd like to welcome Shane Patterson up to start us off and and lead us in a prayer for this afternoon. Can I stand? I'm going to use my Dakota language, my first language, so bear along with me as I uh, use, use this uh, power of our indigenous languages to talk to Wakantaka, the Great Spirit. Atukashila, ate Wakantaka, yota wakha, yota wa unshila. I took a walk, Daka, Tokashila, near Tokahe Yukta, near Nishnana Wakan, Tokashila Wakantaka. Daku wocheki ale, aya tunkaish lawa kantaka he, aya tokahea, ya wo yo oniha. Aya tokaish lawa kantaka ea, which ho ye, ya nayahu unkopi kile. Aya tokaish lawa kantaka hea, which I arch depi. Aya tokaish lawa kantaka makocheki unkitha bile, aya tunkaish lawa kantaka, ya arch depi. Aya tokaish lawa kantaka ea, at Hate Topaki, Aya Tokashla or Kantaka, Wo Yekia, Nayaho Unkopiki. Aya Wiochbia Takia, Wakia Oyate, Hena Wazia Takia, Aya Tatanka Oyate, Naha, Wionha Patakia, Swambri Paska Oyateki, Aya Itoga Takia, Sente Sapa Oyatekile, Aya Kutakia Ahituan. Mu unchima coche makai na Daku oche kia moa niktelo Hena machpia takia Aya wakantakia tonkashila wakantaka Aya tonkashila wakantaka Oyate unkita Aya tonkashila Na we chose on ni Na 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 wo woke unkuyapi Aya tonkashila wakantaka Oyate kile Na ha we choni wash day unkuyapi Aya tayan ya unktapi chichi apilo tokashila wa kantaka. Ahe chomse tokashila opila tanka ewa kielo. Ahe chituelo homotake yo ase. Thank you. Careful, first steps are doozy. <laughs> Thank you, Shane, for honoring us. Um, I guess I should, should have started by introducing myself. My name is Candace Leonard. <laughs> I'm the uh, Regional Director for Indigenous Health within the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. And we're honored to bring you the CEO Grand Rounds event. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our CEO and President, Milton Sussman. Thank you, Candace. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm proud to be the host of the CEO Grand Rounds in Indigenous Health. Today we're going to explore reconciliation. It's a diverse topic with a lot of different and varying ideas and, and notions. But before we explore this topic deeper, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority acknowledges that it provides health services in facilities located on the original lands of Treaty 1 and on the homelands of the Métis Nation. The WRHA respects that the First Nation treaties were made on these territories and acknowledges the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to collaborate in partnership with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in the spirit of reconciliation. I'd also like to, as Candace did, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge our visitors at the very many different sites who have picked up the today's Grand Rounds through the telehealth broadcast. As the, as the mayor of Winnipeg, Mayor Bowman has invested a lot of hard work with regards to reconciliation. 
from the early challenges and controversy that were associated with the McLean's article, Mayor Bowman chose the difficult task of addressing the underlying issues that the article mentioned with fairness, determination, and leadership. His moral compass and vision has guided our city through some very difficult times that are times of tension and uncertainty. He is passionate and committed to building a stronger Winnipeg through greater openness, transparency, and accessibility. Mayor Bowman's Métis heritage makes him the nation's first Aboriginal mayor, and as such, he feels passionately about ending racism in Winnipeg. Mayor Bowman has initiated several important projects and calls to action to make Winnipeg a safe and respectful place for all of its residents, regardless of race, culture, religion, or sexual orientation. A former lawyer, he has served and advocated for the community in many leadership positions within a variety of organizations, including the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce, the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and Kani Kanichak. Please join us in welcoming Mayor Bowman. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for taking time for this, uh, uh, this important discussion. I'm going to keep my comments, uh, as, as uh, was just mentioned, uh, I'm a recovering lawyer. And so uh, uh, being a lawyer and, and now a politician, I'll, I'll keep my comments to under three hours. Um, but uh, I, I understand there's time for, uh, for just dialogue afterwards. So after I finish my formal remarks, hopefully there'll be uh, an opportunity for for healthy, uh, healthy discussion and questions and answers. Um, I do uh, want to uh, obviously just say uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to join you here today. And, uh, and thanks to the WRHA, really, for the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, with you today about reconciliation and our city. I was driving to uh, an event uh, last week, and uh, my wife and I have two boys, Hayden and Austin. Hayden's nine, and... Uh, very aware of the fact that I'm mayor now, and uh, we have really healthy discussions. Typic typically over breakfast, we, we read the paper, and I show them, I, I, and I, I read the stories, whether they're good or not, for me. And we have a good discussion about, well, what did I learn from it, and what are people saying? And um, I was driving to a, a morning event at the convention center, and uh, I, I called home, because I had left before they got going in the day, and. Tracy put Hayden and Austin on. I said, do either of you want to do the speech for me, jokingly? And Hayden said, sure, I'm in my pajamas, but I can do it. And um, I said, well, what, what would you say? And without any hesitation, good, uh, good afternoon, um, without any hesitation, Hayden said, well, I would begin by acknowledging we're on Treaty 1 land and the traditional homeland of the Métis, which I, I have to say, um, for a nine-year-old, uh, I was pretty impressed. It led me with two conclusions. One, he's extremely knowledgeable in the land we inhabit and is steeped in protocol. Or secondly, he's been to way too many of my speeches. <laughs> and, um, but I thought it was, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, when I was that age, the, the idea of even acknowledging we're on Treaty 1 land, the, even being aware that we were on Treaty 1 land, um, as was mentioned, my family is Métis and I'm very proud of it. But um, when I was younger, it wasn't something you really talked about. It wasn't something you were proud of either, I have to say, for, for many people who are Métis or First Nation or Inuit. And uh, that, that needs to continue to change for the positive. People should be proud of who they are, regardless of whether you're Indigenous or, or non-Indigenous. Um, so I, I do want to just begin by acknowledging, of course, as was already acknowledged, we're on Treaty 1 land, the traditional homeland of the Métis. And, uh, as mayor, I get the opportunity to, um, to meet people each and every day, uh, each who uh, have uh, an idea, uh, or three, for how we can make our city stronger. And I also get a healthy dose, a dose of feedback of what's not working as well. And I get to meet business leaders, I get to meet provincial leaders and federal leaders, uh, community leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, social advocates, professors, and yes, doctors and nurses, as well as teachers and tradespeople of all kinds. And people in groups from really every corner of our city, from every walk of life. And it's always an honor for me to connect with people 
who care passionately about Winnipeg and its prosperity, its well-being, its health, and, and its future. And I know many of you here today and those that are watching remotely uh, are, uh, are also passionate about the health of our communities and you're passionate about the people that we all serve. And you also care passionately about the, the future of our city. So from time to time, uh, time to time, as I mentioned, um, I happen to watch the news. Um, whether I, I like the headlines or not, uh, I watch it and I read it all. And I know that your organization, the WRHA, is currently undertaking some significant uh, changes to Winnipeg's health system. And I know Winnipeg's health system is critical it's a critical part of our province's health system. So I understand the significance of the changes that you're making. Uh, change is hard. Uh, at City Hall, uh, I've encountered a, a challenge or, or two or three uh, associated with change. And to all of you here, um, and of course your leadership team, uh, I do wish you all the very best as you work to change and to strengthen our health system. The work that you're doing is important work, and it's, uh, uh, it's work that I'm almost certain will elicit many, many different opinions and criticisms. Change is hard, and change is often necessary. Uh, the theme that relates well to the subject I was invited uh, to, to speak about today, the subject of reconciliation, and how our city and how its people have responded to the issue of racism is something uh, very near and dear to, to my heart, and I know yours as well. Reconciliation and our response has a lot to do with embracing a moment in time that required us to make difficult choices uh, and to embrace change. How's the sound? Do you want me using the mic? The, um, is it okay? Okay. I feel like I'm going in and out, so I, if it's rough on your ears, I can always put the, uh, the wireless on. So let's talk about reconciliation. Uh, one thing for certain is, uh, as BC... Grand Chief Stuart Phillips said it well, and I quote him, reconciliation is not for wimps. Like change, it's hard. It takes courage. But if people have the courage, the, the results can be absolutely amazing. Now, I know from personal experience that there's a lot of courage across our community. And I know from personal experience that there's a lot of courage across our health system. Last year as a year of reconciliation for Winnipeg, we marked a real beginning because of the courage of people in this community. Indigenous and non-Indigenous, newcomers and longtime residents alike. And it's the courage of Winnipeggers that gives me tremendous hope as we move forward. Now you've heard me start with uh, the acknowledgement uh, that we're on Treaty 1 land in the traditional homeland of the Métis. And this acknowledgement now, fortunately, is almost universal uh, across Winnipeg. You'll hear the Governor General, you'll hear uh, Lieutenant Governor Janice Fillman use it, the Prime Minister, Premier pa Bal Pallister, uh, all sorts of elected officials and, and public figures uh, at all levels. But why is it important? Uh, why does this really matter? Well, for a long time, Canada's treaties with First Nations, they, they weren't really talked about a lot. When I was growing up, they, they weren't really talked about. They weren't really top of mind, in my view, for public officials. And if people were aware of them, they treated them like historical documents, collecting dust with um, not much interest in them, to be candid. At least that's what it felt like when I was growing up in, in my community. For First Nations people, though, the treaties have always been meant to be a lot more than historical documents. They were meant to be, and more importantly, felt to be, the opening chapter of an ongoing story. A story, be a story of partnership between First Nations and newcomers. And that's what the treaties essentially are, in spirit and in law. They mattered as much to non-Indigenous people as Indigenous peoples. Pre-colonial and colonial Canada were seeking access to land and to resources. Canada wanted to build a national dream, the Great Railway to link our country from coast to coast. Welcome. First Nations saw the treaties, though, as a bridge to the future, 
and a way to provide for future generations. Both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people saw the treaties as a foundation of mutual peace and mutual security. And without the treaties, there likely would be no Canada as we know it, from sea to sea to sea. There should have been three C's in there. So, and just with, and just like Louis Riel, had it not been for Louis Riel, there, there wouldn't be a Manitoba as we know it. The treaties were the opening of a story for Winnipeg, for Manitoba, and for Canada. A story of peace and of shared par partnership. So most of you here today are, I know, are involved in the health system in some way across various professions and understand the critical importance of partnerships as well as collaboration. So as was mentioned, I practiced law until I got, uh, I got an opportunity to try out uh, a very, a mo even more popular vocation, uh, a politician. But we all know that what a partnership is. It's an agreement that involves two parties working together and it involves and has to involve uh, quite a lot of mutual trust. The story of partnership that the treaties opened was interrupted and that mutual trust was lost. It was fractured. And so when we acknowledge that we're on Treaty 1 land, it's really a small gesture towards reconciliation. A small gesture that we want to rebuild the partnership and regain some of the trust that was lost. A small indication that we want to resume the story of peace and partnerships that were opened by the treaties. So why was the story interrupted, that story of, of peace and partnership that was meant to be? Well, there's so many reasons. But as we all know now, racism was fundamental to the interruption and the resulting disruption and discord. There were many dark chapters which intervened when the story which was meant to be told of Winnipeg and Manitoba and of Canada was interrupted. And of course, the most shocking and disgusting chapter was that of residential schools in Canada. Now, we're fortunate that uh, Senator, formerly Justice Murray Sinclair, uh, serves on my Indigenous Advisory Circle, uh, along with, uh, with many notable community leaders, one of whom is here. And he brings with us the wisdom of an elder in the Indigenous tradition. And as Gany Ganichak formally recognized this year, his significant contributions to rebuilding and restoring wellness and prosperity. He also brings with him the wisdom of an elder in the arts of non-Indigenous jurisprudence and government. He's really a, an incredible bridge builder that we have in our country between cultures. And he shows by example what's possible. When the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission were released, then Justice Murray Sinclair spoke, and his words were incredibly powerful. And I quote, he said, we heard the effects of over 100 years of mistreatment of over 150,000 First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children placed in these schools. Removed from their families and homes, home communities, seven generations of Aboriginal children were denied their identity. We heard how separated from their language, their cultural, spiritual traditions, and their collective history, how children became unable to answer questions as simple as, where do I come from? Where do I come from? If you have children, imagine your children not being able to answer that fundamental question. Where am I going? Why am I here? Who am I? They were stripped of their self-respect and their identity. And it's impossible to imagine a story of peace and partnership gone further astray than that. And it's really diametrically opposed to the image of Canada, the one that we all cherish, a land of tolerance, diversity, and civility. And yet, as history has shown us, and as the TRC documents uh, illustrate, this is exactly what happened. It was, as Senator Sinclair said, quote, one of the darkest, most troubling chapters in our collective history. So it'd be easy to despair, knowing that this dark chapter is there, and knowing the effect that it had and it has right now in our community. 
down through the generations of intergenerational survivors. But as Senator Sinclair said, something that I think we all should take heart. He said, we must endeavor to become a society that champions human rights, truth, and tolerance, not to avoid a dark history, but rather by confronting it. And this is what Winnipeggers from so many walks of life across our community of all backgrounds have tried to do. We've tried to reflect our highest ideals, not by avoiding a dark history, but by absolutely confronting it head on. So as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm sure many of you recall the article in McLean's with the headline, Welcome to Winnipeg, where Canada's racism problem is at its worst. And even though it's been a couple years, uh, it was a couple years ago, I happen to remember that day uh, quite vividly. I had a lot less gray hair then. It was early in my term. And um, Nancy McDonald, who is originally from Winnipeg, the author of that article, uh, she was tough. She was unsparing. Uh, most of all because she showed us we don't just have a dark history. For far too many, the present is dark as well. And it was a pa painful moment uh, for Winnipeg. It was a pa painful moment for me as, uh, as a new mayor. Uh, a person uh, like you who loves our city, who cares deeply about our, our citizens. And it was impossible not to be emotionally moved by the stories that were chronicled in that article. And on that day, we had a choice to make. On that day, we had, as a community, we had to choose between uh, dismissing that characterization or acknowledging that, of course, racism exists in our city. And I have to tell you, uh, I had people advising me that morning that article came out, advising me, be a politician, attack the messenger. I had people advising me, find some sort of distraction, announce something today, just don't talk about it. I had people telling me, just ignore it. It'll go away. Only, you know, by talking about it, people were saying, um, it'll perpetuate racial divides. It'll give haters and racists a bigger platform. I also had telling, and this is what I remember, I had people telling me, you don't want to, quote, own the racism issue. And if I did, it would, you know, I'd, I'd quickly become the go-to person whenever racism reared its ugly head. And lawyers, uh, yes, I have to mention lawyers, uh, were warning me that this issue was fraught with many different pitfalls. So I got a lot of advice that, that morning that the article came out. But on that day in the end, uh, I believe we had to be courageous and we had to be bold and I was really pleased to see this community come together to recognize, of course, racism exists, and that we needed to work together to better address it. So on that day, we, we ended up choosing unity over division. We came together, we could have finger pointed, we could have blamed, and we could have found many, many excuses. We came together when we could have found uh, distractions or diversions. And we came together, I think, to try to better face some painful truths in our country and in our community. We came together to embrace people and diversity and to find ways to better deliver simple dignity and opportunity for everyone in our community. And I know most of us in this room today and those that are watching uh, online have this in com common. We're all problem solvers, or we think we are problem solvers, and we do our best to solve problems. And many of you, of course, aspire to be healers. According to the latest numbers that I've seen, Winnipeg's emergency rooms receive over 300,000 visits a year. If those are accurate numbers, that is astounding in terms of the sheer volume of people and patients that you're helping, my family included. And across the community, at community clinics, uh, at the access centers and public health offices, thousands of people arrive for support, healing, and they look to you to help address many different problems that they've encountered. The health system exists to meet real needs for real people. And that often involves solving real problems. Just the same way at their best. When it, or governments exist to meet real needs for real people. And sometimes that involves solving real problems. So when I took on this uh, wild idea of 
putting my name on the ballot. I got a lot of advice then too. The best advice I had was the worst thing that could happen is you might win. But when I took on this, this wild idea of, of running for office for the first time and running for mayor, I said I wanted to accomplish four things. I said that I wanted to work for a city with uh, more open and transparent government. I wanted to create a growing, thriving, a much more modern city. And a city that would take increasing pride in itself and its people. And a city that would become more fiscally sustainable. So I wanted those things. I still want those things for everyone. For every citizen, from every background. And if some people are excluded from that Winnipeg, the Winnipeg we all love and the one that we dream about, that's not good for anyone. It's not good for all of us. And within the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, I think you strive for exactly the same thing. Your recently adopted strategic plan identifies health equity as a key organizational value that applies to everything that you do. Health equity recognizes that every person should be able to achieve their full health potential regardless of their education, their income, their social inclusion, or their race. These variables can create, as you know, gaps in the levels of health access uh, that our citizens enjoy. Gaps that exclude people from the health care that they need. Gaps that mean some in our city can, can expect to live 19 years less than those who are just a short bus ride away. Gaps that exclude people from the care they need. That's not good for any of us. So there's no question in my mind that we had to react the way that we did to the McLean's article. We had to confront the problem head on with no excuses. What really lifted me up that day, the day that the article hit uh, newsstands across our country, and media everywhere was the way that Winnipeggers reacted. There was just this uh, incredible wave of support for facing the problem head on. That said a lot more about me than it, it said about Winnipeggers and this community that we all live in. The article in McLean's gave us an opportunity to focus and really focus on some big problems that we have as a city. Problems which Let's also be clear, these are Canadian problems from coast to coast to coast, but which we definitely have to address in a determined and in a sustained way. What the initial McLean's article didn't fully account for, in my view, was the depth of caring in our community, the sense of community that we have right here in our city, the determination people have to make our city work at every level, friend to friend, family to family, and in our neighborhoods, and businesses, and community organizations, and in our diversity. The article appeared and people came forward. They stepped up, wanting to understand, wanting to help. I got calls that day from mayors across the country, from federal leaders, from municipal leaders across Canada. Uh, the level of compassion that was shown when people could have, they could have dumped on Winnipeg. And some did. It wasn't universal, of course. People wanting to help. And I said that day that we have a responsibility, a responsibility to turn this ship around and change the way that we all relate, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians uh, alike. Canadians across the country, they've seen the way that Winnipeggers have responded. And I'm encouraged by it uh, tremendously. Nancy McDonald, the author of the original article, has said that she senses at the, that there's change at the grassroots level in Winnipeg, and that Winnipeg seems very different to her now. And I was hugely encouraged, too, by the response to the National Summit on Racial Inclusion that we hosted in partnership with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. It was really overwhelmingly positive. I know, I know many of you were, were in attendance, and so I want to thank you. Um, it really got the discussion going at another level than, than we had had in the past in the city, across our city and across the country. Since then, um, because of that summit, discussions I've had with people, including the Prime Minister, have really said Winnipeg is really stepped up. And it, it has so much more to say about our community and the depth of leadership that we have across many, many different sectors. 
We've also had a tremendous response to 2016 being declared the year of reconciliation for our city. But let's also be clear, this is really just the beginning. Pain that goes back for generations will not be healed in a summit, at a press conference, or in a year. Prejudices that go back for generations will not be washed away in a year. We're striving for very, very profound changes in culture, in attitudes, and more importantly, in actions. And that is going to take time. What's important is that having had a moment of awareness, we follow up. It's important to cultivate awareness, to disseminate knowledge, and advocate for greater understanding and even more positive change. So what does reconciliation mean for us here in this room? Well, it's, it is a complicated question. If you, I mean, you ask anybody, what does reconciliation mean? You're going to get uh, as many answers as there are people answering the question. But I think it's, it's a worthy question to raise, and it's a worthy question to try to answer for each of us. On its most basic level, in my view, of course, is the question of simple human dignity. Young people, working people, elderly people from every background have the right to be treated with kindness, decency, and respect. Reconciliation also means recovering that story, the this Canadian story of peace and partnership that the treaties began to tell. That story we somehow lost track of as a nation, somehow. So a little while ago, uh, Chief Sean Atlio gave an incredible speech to Vancouver Island University, and it was entitled, Daring Greatly Together, Reimagining Canada. So I think it's a speech that would be uh, of interest to, to each of you. Chief Atlio, as you may know, is a former chief of the Assembly of First Nations. And subsequently, he's been chancellor of Vancouver Island University. And he's put a lot of energy and a lot of thought into entrepreneurship and the partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. He says that through the storms of racism, residential schools, and the, de the den denigration of Indigenous cultures, Canada has, and I quote, disowned its own story. He says that the story of peace and partnership has been lost. Indigenous people have ceased to be treated as the kind of partners that the treaties had envisioned. Instead of being decision makers, they have had decisions made for them and to them. Chief Atlio says this is, this is an economic tragedy as well as a social one because it deprives non-Indigenous people of the skills and the talents and the energy of their Indigenous neighbors. And it cuts off Indigenous people from what he calls the tremendous power and the incredible innovative opportunities of the public and private sectors. Chief Atlio says it's time, it's time to dare together to reimagine Canada as the partnership it was meant and it can be. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. In Winnipeg, especially in Winnipeg, we cannot afford to live out a tale of two solitudes in which businesses are deprived of youth, of talent, and potential, and in which Indigenous communities are deprived of economic opportunity. Reconciliation means doing the right thing for human dignity. That's really, I think, the most important thing. And I know that you recognize that. Dignity as a reflection of the self-worth of every person is the WRHA's number one value. Reconciliation also means doing very good things for our community's prosperity and health. Now, I know that for so many of you, what I'm saying isn't really news. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir. But it's a really important song for us all to keep singing very, very loud. At the city of Winnipeg, we're reaching out to Indigenous youth with our Indigenous youth strategy, Oshki, Anishinaabe, Naganiwak. With many community partners, we offer opportunities related to recreation, employment development, with civic departments. We've offered internships, scholarships, training, programs, summer job placements, and career awareness weeks. The common denominator will always be 
a welcoming environment and increased cultural knowledge. Whether it's a mentor, a friend, or a whole network uh, to offer encouragement, it's really the human factor that's always uh, going to make the biggest difference. Of course, beyond building organizational talent, Winnipeg's Indigenous heritage, it's a source of strength and pride for so many of us in our community, regardless of your background. Making us the natural home for the Aboriginal People's Television Network, a great past host to the North American Indigenous Games, a world center for Inuit art, and a focal point for Indigenous art, culture across Canada. Our Indigenous heritage also enables us to do some unique things that you really can't do anywhere else but in Winnipeg. We've, uh, we should be showing the world even more so what we can do and what we should be proud of that we can uniquely do. Affirming Winnipeg's Indigenous heritage opens up new horizons in terms of talent for all of our organizations. It also encourages us to recognize the unique strengths we have as a city in terms of the products, the services, and the opportunities that only we can offer. And that's really definitely something worth celebrating. Growth and prosperity, they're not a zero-sum game. So often the success of one of us fosters greater successes for others across, uh, for others as people from across Canada and around the world to take an interest in all that our city has to offer. This goes back to what Chief Atlio had to say about recovering Canada's story and Winnipeg's story. Racism, racism puts up barriers, barriers that frustrate the human spirit, barriers that are like roadblocks to health, to success, and to prosperity. When we recover the true Canadian story of peace and partnership and inclusion, our highest ideals, we improve our chances of success as well. So declaring last year is a year of reconciliation. It was a really important thing for us to do. And it gave us a, a focus. It gave us uh, a start. But of course, and as I've said, and I think everyone involved has said, it really is just the beginning. Uh, I've been so encouraged, though, by the outpouring of, of care, of concern that I've seen from Winnipeggers, from the reverent and joyful celebration of Na National Aboriginal Day to the Syrian Family Fair held at the old Exite last May, to the empowering attendance at Winnipeg's first walk for human rights in February at the Forks. I've really seen the best of Winnipeggers. And I want to mention, too, in Winnipeg, we rightfully focus on Indigenous inclusion because of our history. But we're also one of Canada's great multicultural cities. And we're becoming more so by the day. As we welcome refugees uh, from around the world, we're reminded of the need for inclusion of all communities in our community. One of the things that's uh, really tugged at uh, my heartstrings is seeing the way that students respond at all levels, hearing university students talk about how their eyes have been opened by courses that teach them about Indigenous culture and history, and uh, also talking with high school students from all over Winnipeg. I've, I made a commitment to visit every high school in Winnipeg. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> I knew that at the time. There's over 60. And speaking with these students, uh, high school students, is, uh, it's an incredible experience. Um, and it's really impressed me so much. It's taught me the truth that's something that Nelson Mandela uh, wrote about in The Long Walk to Freedom. And I'll, I'll quote. He said, no one's born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must be taught to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love because love comes more natural to the human heart than its opposite. The city will keep working to promote inclusion and implementing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And of course, Nancy McDonald, who wrote that original article in McLean's, has said Senator Murray Sinclair told her that, quote, real change isn't going to come from government. It's going to come city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood, and family by family. It's going to come from the grassroots levels. So your efforts 
to promote inclusion across the health system that experiences millions of human interactions daily are absolutely crucial. And I know many of you are likely already engaged in the work of promoting inclusion. Uh, what many of us don't see is all the work that many of you do with individual clients, with patients and residents preparing individualized uh, treatment and health plans that reflect their specific health requirements. And I want to thank the WRHA wholeheartedly. I really want to thank the WRHA for being one of the very first organizations to publicly support Winnipeg's first Indigenous Accord after Council unanimously approved it in March. And I want to thank you for becoming one of over 70 organizations across Winnipeg who will be the initial signatories of the Accord tomorrow morning at the Forks. I also know the WRHA remains committed to adopting the seven TRC calls to action that are specific to healthcare, as well as drawing upon the 94, or all 94, to help improve relationships with our Indigenous community in Winnipeg and really throughout the province. The work being undertaken by your Population and Public Health Indigenous Health Promotion Committee, as well as your Aboriginal Health Program, it's absolutely encouraging, so well done. Over time, this work will help close gaps in our health system. It'll help return a greater sense of self-determination in healthcare for many people. And I also know both as a regional organization as well as the Health Sciences Center that you've struggled significantly with the issue of racism following the death of Brian Sinclair. And I know that was a very difficult time for you. I remember your then Chief Executive Officer, uh, Ms. Erlene Wilgosh, who speaking publicly in response to the Judicial Inquiry Report, acknowledging that racism existed in society and that the health system was no different. And I have no doubt that took tremendous courage. And so my challenge for all of you in this room and watching today is simple. Continue to be courageous. Continue to find and recover your piece of the Canadian story, the story of peace and partnership that the treaties began to tell, that piece of the story that we somehow lost track of over the many, many years. As a health system and as daily problem solvers, as educators, as teachers, as hand holders and caregivers, you can be instrumental in building partnerships and rebuilding the mutual trust that we've lost over the years. We need you to be. Be courageous, be a courageous organization that does the right thing, the hard thing, despite being filled with fear, doubt, or uncertainty. And believe me, it can be scary. I know that to be true. I want to thank you very much for listening uh, patiently so far. Um, I just have a few final closing remarks to share before we open it up for, uh, for Q&A. We've got a lot to be optimistic about here in our city uh, of Winnipeg. Uh, thanks especially to, to all of you. In challenging economic times, uh, analysts forecast solid economic and population growth for us. We are a growing city and one that is planning today to ha help best grow our city to a mo one million people strong. Our sports and the art scenes are thriving. We're looking forward to hosting the Canada Summer Games uh, in days. Uh, I, I lost track. I think we've got to be 30-something days to go. Um, National Geographic recently rated Winnipeg as one of the must, must attend, must visit destinations in the world. Top 20, the only one in Canada. Not Vancouver, not Toronto, not Montreal, not Quebec City, Winnipeg. Only one in Canada. Now what we've been talking about today is something uh, different and uh, an even bigger question. Do we have reason to be hopeful about our future as a more inclusive community? Do we have reason to be hopeful that the shadows from which have darkened our past and our present can be dispelled? Based on everything that I've seen and I've heard over the last two years, conversations with people from every neighborhood and every walk of life, I say yes. Yes, we have reason to hope. Because as Winnipeggers showed that day that McLean's article came out, and really every day since, there are plenty of courageous people in this town. People who are not afraid to deal with problems honestly and head on. People who care so passionately about the ongoing 
journey to reconciliation. I feel tremendous hope. I believe in our community and in Winnipeg, and I believe the beginning that we've made, it's real. Uh, I believe with patience and with determination, um, that will continue. And I believe that we will absolutely reimagine Canada and that we will recover the story of peace and of partnership and shared health and prosperity, a Canada the way it was always envisioned to be. Now, it's really a, it's a tremendous honor and it's a privilege to, to serve as your mayor. And I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity uh, to be here, to, to say a few words and to serve you. And thank you very much for joining us and so many other organizations on, on our ongoing journey of reconciliation. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. Miigwech. Merci. Do you want to just do hands up and give a nod and we can... Any questions? They have to be easy questions. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you told the same story as you did last week, so I might ask a similar question yeah, as I did good. in the meeting. Yeah. Um, so since our meeting on Thursday, um, I've been talking with my daughter, Myla, who's six, about reconciliation and the Indigenous Accord, because we'll both be signing, yeah. uh, and trying to get her to wrap her head around um, what she can do, you know, as a six-year-old and as a future Indigenous leader in this community. Um, and we've been reading these books by an Inuit author about the Inuit experiences uh, of kids in residential school, one of which is called Not My Girl. It's a great book for kids, I think. And uh, she said to me, but those schools are closed. So that led to us talking about the tens of thousands of kids in care in Manitoba right now. And I'm just using that as an example because it's one where every jurisdiction and every system has a role to play in changing uh, both those structures that lead to poverty and neglect in kids in care, addressing the intergenerational trauma, and then creating opportunity. Because I think what we all realize is that outcomes for kids who end up in the system are terrible. Yeah. And the kids who come out uh, in positive quote unquote, ways do it in spite of the systems and not because of it. Uh, so I just wondered if leading up to tomorrow's event uh, and the generations of work we have to come, if you could talk a little bit about your relationship with the other levels of government who also have a role to play uh, and how you're using your position as mayor to leverage those things that are under the provincial jurisdiction uh, yeah. as well in this regard. Wow. Uh, th thank you very much for the question and your ongoing leadership, of course. Um, it's a difficult question. I mean, uh, you know, it's been a real education for me. I mean, I, like I, I mean, as, as you know, I'm Métis, but I mean, I, I was born on Logan Avenue. We, I was raised in Charleswood. The, I mean, uh, I, I, I've had a very, um, I've been very fortunate in my life. My, my life experience is very different from, from many other Métis and First Nation and Inuit. So, um, I don't have a monopoly on ideas for the Métis, let alone Winnipeggers. And it's been a real education over the last couple of years. I've learned a lot from our Indigenous Advisory Circle. Um, you know, when we talk about historical wrongs, what's really been impressed upon me is uh, many feel those wrongs are still being perpetuated right now. So I, I tried to get that across in my, in my formal remarks, is that we need to be analyzing how we, how we relate to Indigenous organizations and people. Um, we've, um, you know, early on in my mandate, I reached out to, uh, you know, the leadership of AMC, AFN, Manitoba Métis Federation, the Manitoba Inuit Association, uh, really all the Treaty One chiefs um, who have residents. They, they all have many, many citizens living in Winnipeg. Um, so I'm talking about, you know, Peguis and Brokenhead and, you know, Southern Chiefs. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous group of leaders. Um, we're trying to, to meet, um, and I, I, I 
when I'm meeting, I it's it's nation to nation. It's like you know you you I there's equality uh, uh, around the around the the table, and I, what I'm trying to do is just listen, listen, and and to try to hear what what's being said. Um, I think that one of the lessons I've learned is really just don't talk about residential schools like a thing of the past because many are living it right now, whether they're uh, you know, intergenerational survivors uh, like Derek Niepenek and others, um, you know, Wab Canoe as well, um, but also be mindful of where we're, where we're continuing the harm. Uh, the cross-pollination of responsibilities between governments is a whole other discussion, and it's one that, um, you know, on, on many issues, uh, we're advised all the time, don't, that's provincial, that's federal, and these are our citizens. I mean, we're, we're helping out with homelessness, uh, you know, and supporting the End Homelessness Winnipeg Initiative. Uh, the Winnipeg Promise with WRHA has been, has been at the table on, on that to try to get kids signed up for the Canada Learning Bonds. Uh, they're not municipal jurisdiction. I mean, that's we could just point the finger as well, but we have to step up. People expect us to do so. Did that answer your question, kind of? Yeah. I could, you can go off on so many on that one. Yeah. Are there other questions, uh, comments? Yes. Please. I think that's for those that are listening. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I have a three-year-old granddaughter, and I went down a slide, and I kind of cracked my tailbone. Well, I'm sorry so. to hear that. <laughs> so. Fortunately, we've got great health care uh, providers here. And I know. <laughs> in this room. That Pan Am yeah. Clinic, man, it takes forever to get in. Um, uh, my name is Serena Hicks. I am an Inuit woman here in Winnipeg. I'm very proud to say that I'm a Manitoban. I was born here. And I think a lot of people, and I don't know, because I've never actually had a chance to sit and, and speak with you. I, I, I don't know your knowledge with uh, the Inuit people here in Manitoba, but there are actual Manitobans mm -hmm. because of residential schooling and day school. And I think one of the things that when I'm, when I'm talking with the youth, um, Facebook Messenger, man, this is a busy place for me. <laughs> um, they, they ask, like, are we recognized here? Are, are we acknowledged here? So I guess asking the mayor, you know, are our Inuit youth, and a lot of them sadly are in care, and I, uh, they're coming from the Arctic and coming to this... I mean, some of these kids haven't even seen... A, a, a street light. <laughs> like I remember. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we're storytellers. So quick story is that m one of my baby cousins, he had come down to finish his his high school. He went to Brandon, and uh, so when it's your baby cousin, they call you auntie. And he kept calling me, he says auntie, auntie, I, I got to go home. And I said, why, honey? Like why? Why do you have to go home? He goes, he goes, well, I've never met a stranger before. I went, oh right, You're from the Arctic. He would never met a stranger before. Yeah. So how do, we, how do you as a mayor, um, how do you see helping our Manitoban and our Arctic, because we get over 15,000 yeah. uh, people from Nunavut, how do we help our youth feel united within this, what I feel is an amazing city. I love it. I, I'm so proud to be from here. I, I never shy away from the fact that I'm a Manitoban. I am also, you know, from Nunavut. I, I yeah. you know, I, I don't, sh I don't, I am Inuit. I don't shy away from that. But how do we? How how can you help? Sure. Well, it's very nice to meet you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing the story. And uh, you know what? I think that I, I think um, what I'm about to say applies equally to uh, to First Nations and, and Métis and and all uh, re everybody, regardless of their background, is. Um, a big part of it is just education. Uh, I don't think many Winnipeggers realize how many Inuit live in Winnipeg, and and certainly, I mean, and then the numbers, uh, the numbers in terms of that that will come south to get healthcare is off the charts. Um, so I, I think step one is just better educating, and uh, secondly is is making sure that we're doing everything we can to make everyone in our community feel like they belong, and. Um, you know, there's. I've always thought there's. There's. Back from my political studies days, and I'm seeing it uh, now, and I'm living and breathing it. There's two kinds of politicians and political leaders. Go with. Go with me on this. 
Yeah. No, no. And it's but there are two kinds. There there are those that will will seek to exploit difference exploit differences for their own political gain. Uh, we see that happening outside our borders right now in spades. Um, and those that will do the heavy lifting to try to bring people together and educating people about the the numbers and the culture that we can learn from in terms yeah. of the Inuit is is something that we're doing right now. The Inuit Art Center is is a tremendous opportunity for that knowledge yes. in our community. It's not the only thing. Yes, because um, I'm not an artist. <laughs> neither am I. <laughs> so okay, I have a challenge for you then. Sure. Um, Aboriginal Day. Yeah. Um, my family and I are going to be um, helping uh, Winnipeggers learn Inuit games. Bring your family. Nice. From 12.30 to 5.30, we'll be there. You know what, I can tell you right now that unless it's in the courtyard at City Hall, I won't be able to come because we have a council meeting on, uh, I, I got to work during the day. So we have a council meeting, but we're having a celebration in the courtyard over the lunch hour. So we're all going to migrate outside, have a celebration there for I think an hour, an hour and a half. It'll continue while we go back into council chambers. Thank you for the invitation I'll catch you though. another day. Please do, yeah, please do. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks. Here at Bowman, I Thank Great. you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Thank very much. Yeah. Cheers. I'm going to fill with water. Thank you. I wanted to thank Mayor Bowman for speaking to us today. I think his his topic and his remarks, I think, were, were both timely and, and very important to to the region uh, and, and not only to the city, but to the region particularly. Uh, as he mentioned, and as all of you know, we have struggled as a region uh, to ensure the well-being and, and the health parity of, a, of members of many of our indigenous nations. And, and it, it's, uh, I don't think, a secret to anybody in our region that many of the people, the indigenous people who work for us often don't feel safe at work. And those are things that we as a region are committed to dealing with. And that's part of the challenge that I think Mayor Bowman presented to us. And I think the, the, the challenge that he presented is one that we are embracing. We are, as a region, uh, moving on, forward on reconciliation. We are working to acknowledge the struggles that we've had in the past, but trying to work a, a way forward that will allow us to reconcile the, the health services of our, and, and, include, and ensure that we have indigenous inclusion, cultural safety, and equitable health for all of the citizens of, of Manitoba. Again, I'd like to thank Mayor Bowman for, for speaking with us today. I'd like to thank you all for coming to our CEO Ground Rounds in Indigenous Health. This event would not have been possible without the, the collaborative approach and our partnership with the WRHA's Indigenous Health and the Universities of Manitoba's Indigenous Institute of Health and Healing. Uh, and, and I think together our organizations have really made this uh, uh, a shared uh, experience and one that, that I think has really benefited uh, all of those who are participating today. Before we conclude, I'd like to call on Shane Patterson to provide us with a closing prayer. Would you please stand? Thank you. Pray along with me again. Tokashila, Atewa Kantika, Ea Woieki, Ea Woyaka Pia, Ea Lila Wopila Tonka Hecha. Ea Tokashila wa Kantika, Woks up a day. Wa unspe, uma spekia de, da wa unspekie, aya tokaishila hea, ake, wopila, tanka hecha. Aya tokaishila wa kontika, oyatikile, aya washichi walks up a day, aya tokaishila wa kontika, ena he tokaishila, okjiapo, taku wokah, taku wo okah nia, aya taku. Daku kire hea tokaishla wa kantika, daku o tehiki. Aya tonkaishla wa kantika hecha, okjia po tonkaishla wa kantika. Aya tekile heche, aya tawapi, aya wola kota, woda kota, unkitha hecha, unkuyapi, tonkaishla wa kantika. 
ya tokata kia de hina we choi chareki ya dayan 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 i charekta dayan i charekta ya tokashi la wa kanta ka na ma kaina ya ya ma koche ma koche oksha do ashte pi ya tokashi la wa kanta ka ya okchi apo ya tokashi la wa kanta ka ya ya one peg de ya khate ya topaki ya ma koche ya e aya tunkaishla he yawashte pi aya tunkaishla wa kontaka aya tunkaishla wa kontaka ya bo pilatranka he cha e wo ie ki de he cha sampa hunkake aya ate na ina he ya thawapi aya wo pilatranka he cha tunkaishla wa kontaka o ya te unki thawapi de aya awayan ka po now we chose on in and now we're walking on Kuyapi. Hope you'll have a good time. Thank you.